coxswain spun that boat around and took off. And just then, wham, the ship right next to ours, about 150 yards away, took a torpedo and blew up. And then the whole hell broke loose. You are about to embark upon the Great Crusade to meet this mounting aggression. And make no mistake about it, good will prevail. I grew up in the Depression, uh, where the most common phrase was, use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. December the 7th, 1941 is, is very clear in my memory. A friend of mine had borrowed his older brother's car, which by the way was an almost brand new 1941 Chrysler Windsor. And new cars were very rare to young boys in those days. In fact, hardly anybody had new cars. And his, the main thing was his brother let him take it on a Sunday afternoon and he picked me up and we went for a drive out into small towns and around the country. It had a radio on it, which was quite unique even then. And it had little push buttons on it and you push this button hard and the little arrow went over here in the new station. And we were riding the countryside playing with the radio and a voice came on and said, all National Guard report to the armory. All National Guard report to the armory. All National Guard report to the armory. I mean, what the hell's going on, you know? We can ride, and it kept the radio kept getting this break in about the National Guard reporting the army. And about twilight, we came back into the city, and in those days, newspapers put out extras. And kids are on the street, extra, extra, Japs bomb Pearl Harbor. My remark was, what the hell is a Pearl Harbor? I had never heard of Pearl Harbor. I knew there was a place called Hawaii where pineapples came from. And that was my first knowledge of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Well, the draft had been implemented, but I didn't even have to register for the draft till I turned 18, and I hadn't even turned 17. But the age for legal enlistment in the Marine Corps of the Navy was 17 years of age. Uh, but at that time, a lot of the young men, it was still, things were still pretty tight around there, and a lot of the young guys were swept up in the euphoria of all the news coming from Europe, the commandos and the stalking and the masking and the building the raids and this, that, and the other thing. And, and guys was, my peers, some of my peers were going in droves, signing up in the Canadian Air Force and going on off to Canada. And I thought this was the thing to do. So I falsified my age on some papers and did a little alteration with them and took them home for my parents to sign them. My dad took one, looked at me at that, and he said, you come over here, we're gonna have a little talk. Yeah. So I had to wait till I was 17. And then my mother made the, I said, when I'm 17, I got talking to the Marine Corps recruiting sergeant. And he says, when you're 17, come on down. And as soon as I was turning 17, I went down and got the papers and put them in front of my parents. And my mother said, well, you're never so happy as when you got a gun in your hand, so you might as well go. We learned the marching manual of arms. We learned to march. We learned to do this, that, and the other thing. And mainly we learned to follow orders. Then we went to the rifle range. And at that time, the rifle was the United States caliber rifle in 1903, a bolt-operated, clip-fed shoulder weapon. And uh, we fired, went out the rifle range, we fired. We had to get up early in the morning and do our firing because if you waited till later on in the morning, the heat waves shimmer off the marshes, wouldn't let you see your target. Um, we, had to, we had to perform on the bayonet course, we had to we had dummy bayonets. We had to run the course in a certain amount of time. We were taught the proper way to throw a hand grenade. Uh, we had familiarization firing with the 45 pistol, uh, and then we then we had two weeks mess duty, which all guys had to do. Paid back for all those meals you sat down and ate in the chow hall and didn't have to do any work. And I was in a casual company. Then we sent up to uh, Camp Lejeune to form the 21st Marines. Well, we went from Camp Lejeune, which, by the way, was not Camp Lejeune then. It was the Marine Corps based New River, North Carolina. We went to Camp Elliott in the fall, in November, end of October, November, and we did some snooping and pooping in the woods around Camp Elliott, which is now part of Miramar Air Station, 
And then we went on a ship in, a, in the harbor of San Diego, a salt transport. In fact, I can even remember the name of it. It was the USS Franklin Bell. And we did out and did some maneuvers on where this, that beats the, sea, the seals used now at Coronado. And we did a, a landing at San Clemente. And they took us off of San Clemente and brought us on to Oceanside, another practice landing, and put us into Camp Pendleton. We were the first ones to occupy the brand new barracks at Camp Pendleton. They had just turned, the, just got the electricity turned on. After that, they they put us on the took us down to San Diego one day and they put us on a great big ship. It was the SS Lure Line. It had been converted into a troop ship. There was a, over 5,000 of us on board the ship. There all those lovely state rooms. They had put steel bunks in there, all, the, all the state rooms and rooms. And uh, I remember when we left San Diego Harbor, we pulled away from the pier when the tugs cut loose. We went out the end. They put, pulled the anti-submarine net back and the destroyer went out ahead of us, and it was just a twilight, and we got well clear of the, of the submarine net in the entrance, and the destroyer, I remember the blinking light in the destroyer went like this or something at our ship, and he made a turn, and he started back in, and they put the hammer down on the lure line, and we started out, all alone and lonely, and it was a very lonely feeling to see that destroyer leave us. We went straight to Auckland, New Zealand. There was no military defense available in New Zealand. All of their troops had been in North Africa for three years, and so we garrisoned, you might say we garrisoned the island. It was convenient down there. We were near out in the Pacific. From there we went, after, after in late May, we went, went up the Guadalcanal, which had been declared secured on the, in February. <coughs> we set up a base camp, the whole damn division was in one, one coconut grove, 19 to 20,000 of us living in one big coconut grove. And that's a lot of coconut trees. I had a taste of war before I was actually in combat. Although Guadalcanal was secure, washing machine Charlie was over about every night. And with a few bombs, we were unloading ships and we were on a work detail. We should have been down in the in the hold of a ship. This other fellow and I had said to the coxswain, this LCVP, don't you need somebody down here to help you know, with the deaths, he said, yeah. So he sold to the sergeant in charge. He said, I need these two guys to stay with me. So the rest of the guys went up to, up to cargo nets into the hold of the ship where they carried the stuff and put it in the cargo nets. And we took one load and we went ashore, we put it up on the beach and we manhandled it out. And I think it was a half 60 millimeter or more ammunition in the, in the clusters and some stuff in crates. We went back, pulled up under the fantail of the ship for, for our orders to where, to where to pull up next. And a voice yelled down, condition red, stand clear. And I remember the prop turned on the, we were right next to the uh, turbulence of the water with the ship turned. And the coxswain spun that boat around and took off. And just then, wham, the ship right next to ours, about 150 yards away, took a torpedo and blew up, and then the whole hell broke loose. Uh, 30 caliber, 50 caliber, 40 millimeter, 20 millimeter, traces, boom, boom, they were torpedo planes that were flying low. And we were in that boat, and he was heading out away from there. And I thought we were going to get hit by some unfriendly, friendly fire. By the time uh, Condition Green was declared, the shooting stopped, we were halfway over to Tulagi. And that was long, we were quite a while getting back, and when we got back to the beach, all the other guys that had been in the work party had been put ashore and put on a truck and taken back to the camp. And me and the other fellow, we had to walk and, and, walk and finally got a truck going our way. It was a, by then it was three o'clock in the morning. We pulled into the camp, the first sergeant said, hell, there you are, I was just getting ready to put you down as MIA. <laughs> So I learned then that there was, the game was for keeps. Yeah. My first taste of battle was uh, just off just offshore Bougainville. We were, we were on an APD, uh, which was an auxiliary personnel destroyer. It was a World War I destroyer where they'd taken two stacks out and it would carry about a company of Marines. And the convoy was started being harassing us about midnight. And, uh, 
we passed handled ammunition, 20 millimeter reels of ammunition uh, from storage to the gun tubs and 40 millimeter ammunition and the destroyer beside us, uh, about 500 yards of off our stern took a torpedo. And by then, then it was, it was daylight and uh, we put on the boats and went ashore. Um, the first wave had already been ashore and they already cleaned out the it was very light resistance where we went in at Cape Torquina and we hung around there and ineffectively fired at some planes that were with our rifles at planes that were trying to dive bomb the, the uh, LSTs on the beach. And by the way, something I hear nobody will talk about anymore. What kept those planes from getting too close to the LSTs with barrage balloons? Those huge balloons of the cable they put up with those cables, they had cables dropped from them, kept the planes from diving in too close. But when they pulled out their dive, they came right around past where we were hidden in the bushes at the edge of the beach, and we were firing at Jap planes with our M1s. I fired one M1 so it got so damn hot that the barrel band char made the wood on the upper handhold made it black. <laughs> but it was like, that was kind of fun. But uh, yeah, then it was. After then, we moved on up, and we were not we were not engaged directly with the enemy. Uh, we were, we did patrols. We set up a perimeter defense. We relieved the people in front of us. We set up a perimeter defense. Our main objective was to let the Seabees build an airfield down there so they could run planes up the bomb truck. We went from Bougainville back to Guadalcanal, and then we were supposed to have gone to New Ireland. And then we decided to bypass that, and then we went to Guam. And then we were in Guam on July 21st, uh, and we, on Guam, it was July, August, September, we finished mopping up, and then we started training for, equipment and training for Iwo. We left Guam in, sometime in January for Iwo Jima. It was a tent set up with Actually, armed sentries placed around it, and only certain officers were allowed in there. And that went on, there was big rumors about it. We didn't, never even heard the name Iwo Jima until we were on a ship on the way up there. And then they had mock-ups, and they got us in groups on the deck, and showed us aerial photos, and there's nothing, just bare land. Oh, the problem, they didn't say this is probably a, 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 a pillbox, and this is probably a pillbox with their low-level pictures, and nothing, just the name. And on D-Day, when we went, in, we were up on the deck, uh, waiting to go over the side. When the bar, onshore bar, bar was going on, we were watching that. It was terrific, a terrific display. And uh, the first wave, the captain came on the ship and said, the first wave has hit the beach. There is no opposition. And we said, oh, yay, it's going to be a piece of cake. And uh, they, we went over the side and got in the landing craft, and we headed for the beach, and then we started circling. And then we headed for the beach, then we started circling. And we did that all damn day long. And there was, we found out later, there was no room on the beach for us. The beach was just a disaster. Uh, we went back to the ship, we had to jump from the landing craft to the little, uh, platform a little landing and climb up this little bows and landed back to the ship again. And it, the sea was kind of rough. The big ship was going like this and the little one was going like this and we had to jump from here to there and up. And we were loaded, you had a helmet, gas mask, you pack, two canteens of water, a couple of units of fire, your leggings. You, if you'd ever slipped and missed, you'd have gone to the bottom like a lead balloon. You'd have gone right straight down. And that scared the living hell out of me. And we didn't go ashore till the next day. Well, it was sort of uneventful, but when we got to the beach, the carnage and the wreckage and the debris on the beach was the reason they put us ashore right then. They needed manpower to get the crap off the beach and move it. And if we were assembly lines, there's a big picture of guys taking supplies in an LST and some of the magazines. But we did that. We moved get, we moved supplies off the beach before the, before the tide got them. There were a few rounds came overhead, but there was no shelling on us. And we slept that night. 
up there in the shallows right there, just over the, over the second rise of land uh, that night. But we were there, and then the next morning we were told to, we were, we were moving up to relieve a company of the, of the uh, uh, fifth, I don't know what company it was, but it was so we went uh, along the island, around the side, along the way, airfield, and, and across the airfield into that rough ground on the other side. We got shot at a little bit going across the airfield, which was, you know, they were still up in Sabachi and they were still on the high ground the other end. And we set up a, a company command post and the company commander and platoon leaders went forward to the company we were leaving. And there was, where we settled in, there was a guy on the stretchers, which was one of the units that we were leaving. I guess he'd been doped up with morphine because he started moaning. He was coming out and he started moaning. And the first sergeant said, you, you, you and you, grab that, get that guy the hell out of here. So the four of us grabbed the stretcher and went back across the airfield, and which wasn't a very, we went, it was probably the fastest stretcher movement there ever was. Um, it wasn't pleasant. The stuff was cracking around our heads and zinging and banging. We went down the embankment and we met a stretcher party coming up from the beach and turned it over to heard the guy over there. And then we started back and a hell of a big mortar barrage came down and walking closer to us. It was the big stuff, it wasn't little stuff. And the last thing I remember was jumping into a big crater. My next recollection, I was on the beach and they were pinning a tag on me and some guy lit a cigarette in his face and stuck it in my mouth. I don't know, I have no recollection of going over that, into that hole where that stuff was busting all around us. And uh, they put me on a, a transport to be converted into a hospital ship for, I guess, because all the guys were walking wounded with arms or something like that, people like me, no visible wounds and stuff. And that, that was the end of my sojourn on Iwo Jima. We were in the hospital for about four weeks, and then by then, four or five weeks, then the division we were coming, they came back to Guam. And then the doctor came out and talked to all of us, said, you guys are looking to go home. He said, but we're gonna send you back to duty because you're gonna get home faster, going back to duty because all you old timers that have been out here for 30 months are going back. And if we go through medical, it's gonna be, might be four or five months before you get there. So they sent us back to a casual company and back to the, our company. And when we get back to the company, the first side said, all you, all you old guys now, get your sea bags packed and keep them packed. And don't leave this area without checking in every hour. Don't go visit your friends over at battalion headquarters or anything, stick around, because you're gonna go home. And the strangest thing was, I'll never forget it. They, they, we got the news that Frank and Roosevelt had died and was it half an hour later, the first side and said, you guys get your bag, sea bags out in the road, the truck's on the way. So I always connect that. I always know what day it was that I got to come home. And they put us on a, hook us down to Apra Harbor there in Guam, put us on a, a Jeep carrier uh, that was going back to the States. Uh, they had no air crew and stuff on board, so they had a lot of, a lot of extra bunk space. And we stopped at Fort Island on the way back. They didn't let us off the ship. And, and we were in San Diego. We were warned not to buy any cigarettes on the ship where there were 50 cents a carton and they were taxed on shore. Uh, and don't bring any souvenirs, you got any, don't take anything, we were told that at Guam, don't bring any broken down carbines or pistols or uh, the hand grenades, don't bring, because they're going to go through your customs and you'll get locked up if you're caught. We pulled in San Diego Harbor, we put our sea bags on shore, we walked down the ramp, got on the bus, went over to recruit people. Nobody even looked at us. They reprocessed it in the, in the recruit center, uh, sent us, assigned us to a station somewhere near our, where we enlisted. Uh, and they put us on a, on a train. They kept us there about five days, new uniforms, all the time, blah, blah, finished exams and stuff. They put us on a train, wouldn't let us off, and took us across the country. Got to Pennsylvania Station, New York City. They handed us a 30-day furlough paper and back pay and said to me, I'll see you in Portsmouth, New Hampshire in 30 days. So that was, that was the end of my trip and I finished my enlistment out uh, in the Marine Detachment Naval Prison in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, 
Uh, by the way, on my 30-day furlough, I got married, uh, and uh, I was discharged at the end of May in 45, 46.